is. Uh, you can see them even better from above. You actually have to keep them separately because they tend to get pretty aggressive when eating. They've been known to actually bite each other's limbs off. It is a natural obstacle they encounter in the wild at some frequency. This creature is an axolotl, a type of salamander. Its ancestors swam in a vast network of lakes that once spanned the Valley of Mexico. It's where Mexico City is located today. By some estimates, less than 1,000 adult axolotls live in the wild, maybe as few as 50 in what little habitat is left. But these axolotls were born in the lab. There are among over a million that exist in captivity worldwide. Why have they long fascinated researchers? It's not their seeming smiles that stand out. Unlike other amphibians, which undergo metamorphosis before moving on land, axolotls typically spend their entire lives underwater, never losing their external gills. They still have all the machinery to go through the normal amphibian metamorphosis, but they just don't do it anymore. They've lost the trigger to do so. Where we are in time now is this really fascinating, fast evolving pocket in the axolotl evolutionary history. Connor McMahon is a graduate student in the Redeen Lab at Whitehead Institute. The group studies regeneration, or the ability to regrow missing body parts. It's a natural talent for certain invertebrates, like the flatworm or starfish, and even a few vertebrates. That's where the axolotl comes in. The fact that axolotls kind of naturally stay in a juvenile state forever, my impression is that that uh, is a bonus for their regenerative ability. Axolotls can regenerate whole limbs and tails. They can regrow parts of their heart and liver, and most impressively, pieces of their spine and brain. There's so much detail that has been characterized about their regenerative feats, all of which regenerate in ways that seem totally alien. Many of McMahon's colleagues focus on planarians, a flatworm that can regrow virtually its entire body. In planarians, certain genes are continuously expressed in particular areas of the body. They are known as positional control genes. They're like signposts announcing a town or region. Together, they create a map of the body. Disrupt the expression of these genes and a planarian can't regenerate properly. It might, for example, end up with an extra tail or head. Positional control genes are important not only for regeneration, but also for development. They appeared early on in our evolutionary history, in common ancestors shared by a diverse range of species alive today. This suggests that they play similar roles in development across animal species. We know a lot about the kinds of genes that are required to properly shape the limb during development, where they're expressed, how they're expressed, how they regulate each other. But McMahon notes that the genes are not as well understood in the context of regeneration. Could insights into how animals regenerate lead to breakthroughs in regenerative medicine? My work is a big step in that direction, which is taking one core piece of how uh, regeneration works in planarians, um, which is the importance of positional information in adult tissues, uh, and looking at other clades of animals to see to what degree that quality um, is also present. The overarching thing is like that they were looking for is positional information uh, that is regionally restricted, informs fate decisions, uh, and is probably cell type specific. If the rules of regeneration are in fact evolutionarily ancient or can be generalized across species, what does that mean for us? Could insights into how animals regenerate lead to breakthroughs in regenerative medicine? You know, this like sparkly, really undercharacterized thing that so many animals can do that we can't. Uh, it's kind of unavoidable to, to not try to think about, okay, like how, how can we get closer to this really, really cool state? If we want to try to make regenerative medicine in humans as best as possible, is to really, really importantly characterize all of those three qualities in humans and in vertebrates and in mammals as best we can uh, to try to figure out what we need to actually add back in order to get back to a regenerative state.